cloud. Okay. So I right, I'm kicking it off. Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to Loud and Agile Network. We are super excited because this is our first anniversary. Um, last year, uh, we had just started in January, and uh, we, as a team, we were able to present 12 wonderful meetups to share and build our community. And uh, so excited to be at this juncture. And I want to thank each one of you for being part of our journey. Um, next month on February 18th, uh, we are going to be having Tricia Broderick, who would be presenting her topic, Leadership When Good Intentions Backfire. Uh, also, uh, our February event is going to be part of the Agile 20 Reflect Festival, which is an international Agile festival that is celebrating Agile's first, uh, sorry, 20th birthday. Uh, yeah, so I'm getting confused. First anniversary, 20th birthday, lots of fun stuff happening. Uh, so please do join us for that. And also for Agile 20 Reflect Festival, there are tons of great meetups throughout the month. In addition to that, we also have the A20 Agile Conference, which is happening right here in the Washington DC and worldwide, obviously it's virtual, but Loud and Agile Network is, um, it is a, not only a part of it, um, everybody from Loud and Agile Network, all the organizers are also organizers for the A20. So we're super excited for that as well. Today, we have a wonderful speaker. I like to call him our local Agile celebrity, Jesse Favell. And he is gonna be talking to us about 20th anniversary of agility, reflections, tough questions, and surprising answers. I'm not gonna read everything about him because he is famous and I think everybody knows a whole lot about him. But um, recently his book got published in July called Untapped Agility, Seven Leadership Moves to Transform Your Transformation. Uh, wonderful book, if you haven't read it, please make sure you get a copy. Um, I have known Jesse personally for the last 10 years or so, and it's, it's amazing. Uh, that Jesse has gone through this journey, helped so many people uh, in our community, in the DMV, and we are super excited to have him here. So without further ado, please uh, welcome Jesse Fevel. Wow, Toby, I don't know who this Jesse guy is, but I want to meet him. Uh, <laughs> so first, I want to say a big thank you, personal thank you to Toby. He asked me a year ago to speak at this meetup, and apparently... I just never noticed his message on his LinkedIn DM, or I was like, oh yeah, I'll get back to him. And, and, and so he didn't, he didn't unfriend me. <laughs> he still reached out. So thank you, Toby. Thank you, all of you. Yes, all of you are agile champions too. All of you have had a material impact on the state of the professional world over the last 20 years by trying this out on your teams, maybe advocating it with your boss or, or maybe whatever role that you're playing, but this agile thing, 20 years, oh my goodness. And so tonight I'm excited to share with you some of the things that I've seen along the way. And uh, I, I see some familiar names here that are, uh, that are a part of the meetup today. Uh, in particular, uh, Jim York was the co-trainer at my first scrum class ever. Uh, mm -hmm. That was here in the DMV area. And, and so uh, I think uh, he's seen a few things along the way. So let me first start with the key message or a, a key idea. The key idea is that we did something amazing. We did something Amazing. This is a famous quote that is uh, is somewhat misattributed to Gandhiji, uh, but is 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 really reflects a lot of his thoughts in in his book. First they ignore you, then they laugh at you, then they fight you, then you win. And as someone who came into Agile, uh, as someone trying to advocate for this approach to the project management community, who was not very happy about this Agile thing happening. I can, this, this, I feel this, 
I felt those project managers ignoring me, then mm -hmm. laughing at me, then fighting me, and then saying, Jesse, how do we do this? <laughs> <laughs> so I'll tell you what, uh, ladies and gentlemen, agile champions, practitioners, if you're a scrum master, if you're an engineer, uh, a coach, doesn't matter what your role is, this is something to feel good about. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about my story. I started uh, this agile thing in the mid nineties as a software engineer, uh, was in, um, I was working at the Hughes building, uh, in, in Landover, Maryland on a NASA contract out of the Goddard space flight center. That was when I first started noted like my indoctrination into waterfall. And then uh, I started dabbling with some of those techniques in, in the late 90s. The Pragmatic Programmer was the book that opened my eyes to some of this stuff. And then in the mid 2000s, I started moving into the project manager profession because I, I, I just felt like I could be the greatest engineer in the, in the company and our projects were still gonna fail because of leadership issues. And I'm gonna be the leader that fixes everything until I realized that that's actually pretty hard. And so then in 2009, I, uh, I started shifting more and more into agile consulting and training and coaching. And so I've seen this stuff uh, along the way and we got three basic stories to tell. Well, the first story is gonna be a blitz walk of history, uh, a blitz run through of history on the rise of agility. We're going to talk about when did things happen. We're going to uh, we're going to look at different streams of evolution. On the other hand, there was a cost, and we're going to look at what did it cost for all of this positive momentum. What was what was what were some of the externalities, side effects, and the dark side that along the way. And yet it turns out that there are some things that we can take away from that, that'll be a little bit inspiring that it doesn't have to be, it doesn't have to be a negative story that in order to achieve progress, there's these some problematic questions. It's actually really inspiring to see what's coming next or where we are here in this moment, 20 years later. And I know that we are about to enter into an entire month of reflective meetups and presentations. And Toby mentioned that we're gonna do an entire conference reflecting on 20 years. And the uh, Scrum Alliance is also gonna be hosting an event that's gonna be reflecting on 20 years of agility. So you're gonna have an opportunity to see lots and lots of other perspectives, but this is Jesse's perspective as somebody who's been working here in the, in the DC uh, metro area in those three roles. So let's, let's just kind of get started a little bit about uh, where, where, where did we begin? When did things start happening in the rise of agility? Well, here's an interesting graph that uh, Google Trends started tracking data in 2004. And over the last 16 years, we've seen the amount of energy around this agile conversation, whether it's the blue graph of just the generic word agile or the red graph of agile software development, it's a very similar trajectory. And what you see is that there, we've had a 4X growth in mind share around this agile conversation over the last, just the six, last 16 years of 4X growth in mind share. And, and when you ask about, well, when did it, that 2004, I mean, I mean, like, wow, I mean, when, when and what and why? Well, it helps to remember that this started really in the 90s where there were some key issues. Project bureaucracy is what motivated uh, a lot of the original Agile Manifesto thought leaders to come together. There was also this technology divide where everyone was broken up into silos and I'm a power builder uh, developer. You remember power builder? Or someone would say, well, yeah, I, I only work in SunSpark, C++, remember SunSparks uh, machines and, and uh, <clears throat> there, all that stuff. But there was also this concern that with large scale programs, you know, you, you can you can be successful with a small software project, but the larger programs, you can't do that. Then we got to go back to hierarchy. And about that hierarchical culture, that's, that was problematic in the 90s too. I'm the project manager, do what I say, or I'm the boss, do what I say. And then there's a lot of business traditions about finance and about governance and 
And so these were the problems that we were running into. And then this happened. Burr, 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 the manifesto for agile software development, where several IT thought leaders, software thought leaders came together and started saying, you know, uh, we do things differently and we do them, we do them pretty well. And that it's usually what people look at as the inflection point, the turning point in the way that technology projects, software projects, or even work in general was done. And we went from project bureaucracy to project agility in 2001. But what's interesting is a lot of stuff happened before then. Before the 2001 Agile Manifesto, the 1986 spiral model from Barry Boehm and the new, new product development game in the Harvard Business Review was the inspiration for Scrum. Scrum didn't exist, would not have existed were it not for that article. And then in 91, James Martin introduced RAD, Rapid Application Development, which I, which everyone, when you, they first heard about agility, they said, oh, that's just RAD or, or JAD, right? But then some more things started happening. Scrum came out officially. It was announced in 19, the 1995 Oopsla conference. And, and then Ward Cunningham, uh, who was at the Agile Manifesto event, he started uh, encouraging um, people to share their thoughts on this strange new technology that he invented called a wiki, where you can actually just, you can, as a visitor to the website, can change the content of a website. Isn't that, don't you have to be a web admin? Remember web admins? Remember, don't you have to be a web admin to change the content? I can change the content of a web? Uh, and so Ward's Wiki is where people started talking about these ideas. And one of those ideas that came out was extreme programming in 1998 was officially uh, featured in a software magazine as a case study, the Chrysler payroll project. And all of that led up to the, the inflection point, but then more stuff started happening because right about the same time, this idea of retrospectives started coming in vogue because uh, Scrum in 2001 didn't have retrospectives necessarily as, as frequently as, as, as it does today. And then in 2007, here comes Kanban. People will be like, you know, there's a, what, if we, what if we just don't bother with teams? What if we just, what if we just track the value, uh, the value flow, the value stream and, and where that goes? 2010 saw the introduction of Agile Coaching. Agile Coaching, there are now 5,000 open Agile Coaching positions on LinkedIn. This is, this is a huge thing. Many of us here today are Agile Coaches. And that came 10 years after uh, the Agile Manifesto as a, as, a, as a profession, as a discipline. And then for my money, it all came to a head in 2017 where the Agile Alliance and the Project Management Institute together co-developed the Agile Practice Guide, which is a free download to members of either organization. So if you're a member of the Agile Alliance, it's a free download. If you're actually, don't let anyone know, but if you just Google Agile Practice Guide and you look at the Agile Alliance link, it takes you straight to the download. So you don't even have to be a member. But who could have conceived that the Rebel Alliance would align with the Death Star on the very topic that they disagreed about? It just took 16 years, uh, and, and I was privileged enough to, to be on the team that developed that guide. And man, so we solved the problem, right? Project agility, we got it, except um, <clears throat> what about that technology divide? Well, we heard this thing called DevOps in 2009, and, it, and now Agile also means tech. Yeah, the, we, we heard about software development practices, but um, DevOps is what matters until you realize it was those software development practices back in 1998 with the launching of JUnit where automated testing now is suddenly accessible to regular people. I didn't have to be an expert developer. I could just, I could just try it out. And then cruise control was the first mainstream app that would help automate some of that unit testing and, and schedule it. And at the same time, there was a backlash against the process heavy IT service management or ITIL methodology. And so visible ops started coming in as a lightweight alternative to ops uh, and uh, IT operations. And then 
um, we started seeing continuous deployment. Uh, Timothy Fritz coined the term continuous deployment in 2009 at the same time that uh, the Velocity Conference um, issued uh, its uh, provocative talk about um, uh, uh, 10 deploys a day at Flickr. But more stuff kept happening. Docker, Docker didn't show up until 2013. And then the State of DevOps report was really popular. Every year, there's a new State of DevOps report that comes out and tells us what it does mean with DevOps and where is it going. And then today, it's it's a $3 billion industry because Gartner in 2011 said people need to pay attention. So we solve that problem. So agile projects overcome bureaucracy. Great. Now, software engineering practices are mandatory, right? Because if you're not doing test-driven development or continuous integration, then you're not doing DevOps and then you're a bad leader and you're a bad organization. So everything's great, except what about large scale programs? This th does this thing scale really? Uh, because we're talking about small teams all the time, small teams. So you can't possibly build a jet fighter, can you? Well, when we talk about large scale agility, everyone looks at SAFE. SAFE was the big milestone. It's when we solved the problem. In 2011 was the first official release of SAFE. But a lot of stuff happened before then. Did you know the Scrum of Scrums was formally defined for the first time in 2001? And then they started going into practice. At Yahoo, Yahoo was one of the biggest deployments of Scrum and other agile methods at the time. Nokia Siemens was the first introduction of uh, a large scale scrum approach that would then be written about in 2010 by Craig Larman and Boz Vode in their book. And, oh yeah, this agile unified process was, was is, can you be agile and use RUP? The rational unified process, can you? Well, so IBM took a shot at it and they created their own agile process for trying to do large scale programs. But SAFE is not where it ended. In fact, we're starting to see more and more things. The Spotify model was popularized by the case study that uh, Henrik Niebuhr uh, launched in 2012. And then, anybody remember healthcare.gov? I remember the Scrum DC user group met in Arlington where we did a retrospective on healthcare.gov and man, what a disaster. Well, President Obama had his own retrospective and created the digital service where he was gonna transform the entire federal government technology platforms. And then in 2018, you know you've made it when you're on the cover of Harvard Business Review and Agile at scale, they started talking about 3M and the large scale agility programs they have in place over there. And then in 2019, there's that Death Star again, Project Management Institute, purchasing disciplined Agile, which was originally the Agile Unified Process. So the Agile Unified Process, 14 years later, is now an official part of project management. Boom, mind blown. So we solved that problem, right? We're done. We solved project bureaucracy with the technology divide and large scale programs, except well, what about culture? Doesn't that matter? Well, the big moment that, that really put organizational culture and organizational consciousness, suddenly now, if you're a leader, you start talking about funny words like consciousness. In 2014, Frederick Lelou put out Reinventing Organizations where he applied modern philosophical thinking on stage-based development, applied it to the office. Wow, well, we understand culture, except there was some stuff that was going on in the Agile community before he started his book and he mentioned how awesome we were. 2007 was with when Brian Robertson, I met Brian Robertson at a tech conference in about uh, it was 2005 is when I met him doing a talk on extreme hiring. And what he was doing is he was exploring holacracy. And then Wisdom 2.0 was a conference that started in Silicon Valley as a way to introduce, as an antidote to the technology infatuated Silicon Valley. How do we reclaim our humanity in the face of, te of tech? And remember Drive? If you've ever been to an Agile meeting or a workshop or, and heard autonomy, mastery, and purpose, 
those words that are now common in our language came from the book. Oh, and by the way, Dan Pink is a DC resident. He's a former speechwriter for Al Gore. So he's one of us. And then liberating structures. That happened in 2014 as a series of techniques we can use to help both display a modern consciousness culture, but also encourage it. And then Zappos in 2014. And then 2014, a lot of things happened. Zappos officially adopted holacracy. And then more stuff started happening. Our, uh, the XP shop, Menlo Innovations, wrote a book called Joy Inc., the CEO of that book. And then we started seeing sociocracy coming in. And then something bizarre happened in 2015 where Accenture, Adobe, and Deloitte said no more annual performance appraisals. What? What is this? touchy feely kumbaya nonsense. No performance appraisals. Aetna in 2016, they have a chief mindfulness officer now. What is this? And in 2019, the Scrum Alliance did an experiment for two years where they had co-CEO, a CEO that's externally facing, product owner, and a CEO that's internally facing, Scrum Master. And so now we're starting, we're starting to have real conversations in executive leadership circles about evolving our culture beyond a lot of the, the, the kind of expectations of what a company is supposed to be. And so that starts challenging business tradition and on it itself. And so now we're starting to look at, well, what is business agility like? Is this extend beyond tech to the fundamental business model itself? And so the Business Agility Institutes uh, coin, uh, didn't necessarily coin the term, but started popularizing the term with a series of mini conferences, fostering dialogue on this topic. But it turns out it was, it, it, this was an inflection point building on what was already happening. Wikispeed was super popular because the, the, they had this cool agile project that was then invited to the Detroit Auto Show. And now these major automakers are starting to rethink how they can build vehicles at scale as their business. Lean Startup came in 2011 on, it was, it was building up before then because it was a reaction to the dot bomb era, but, but it, the, 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 the Eric Reese's book kind of now made funding review boards and MVPs and pivots now entered into our language. And then uh, the Project Management Institute was trying to avoid the um, large scale agile programs. And they were trying to instead to think about how can we, how can leaders have business organizational agility? What does that mean? And the Scrum Alliance started showing up at the, the, the Drucker Forum and more stuff happened even after the word became cool. Namely, Beyond Budgeting, which had been around for 20 years itself, suddenly became popular because there was a book that was launched about it. And Lean Agile Procurement, like, what if, what if our contracts could be collaboratively emergent? Not the product, the actual contract itself. What if we could have a workshop where competitors collaborated with each other on how we were going to do a technology contract? Oh, crazy. Agile HR now is a thing. And then this idea of a project mindset where we're gonna, you know what, we're gonna reorg who you work for. We're gonna change the org structure to a productized organization where we're not gonna have projects anymore. And then all of this was officially documented now in Scaled Agile 5.0. So that now if you're doing Agile at scale, you're not just doing projects, you're rethinking your entire business model. So this has been a bit of a journey uh, and it, it brings us to our first major uh, reflection, which is overcoming one problem reveals the next problem we need to climb. And so this is something that we can foresee coming to uh, in the next five, 10 or 20 years that as good as, as much as we figured out already, guarantee that we're gonna start realizing that there are some other problems that need to solve. Uh, in the future. For example, uh, social justice at the office, equal pay. We're starting to really attack those systemic issues that who knew 20 years ago that these were gonna be on the radar. We, we, we couldn't even see those problems the way 
uh, that they're being seen today. So feel good about the momentum we've made. Feel good about this momentum. For every problem that we've solved, uh, there was an inflection point on this flow of evolution, these parallel streams of evolution and, and improvement and transformation. Um, but recognize there's going to be more coming. So that, ladies and gentlemen, is the rise of agility. Something to feel good about, something to something to like, wow, that's, that's pretty good. Like, and each one of those different streams had its own inflection point. And it built on work that had been done before the inflection point, and it served as a spark to ongoing work, and it all came at a cost. And so this is the part where we start looking in the mirror a little bit. Uh, what are you talking about, Jesse? Agile's awesome. There's nothing wrong with Agile. Not at all, except, <clears throat> let me ask, who wants to get certified? Yeah. Would you like your digital... Uh, your disciplined agile lean scrum master, or would you like your advanced product owner, or would you like your professional agile leader? But don't forget the Prince two agile. We gotta get. Well, maybe you should be a release train engineer. And uh, look at this. This is crazy. You wonder why people just starting on this agile conversation get confused. Good God. And then. Uh, don't mind that because now you got to learn all the methodologies that come with the training. So this graphic came out in 2016. There was a Deloitte consultant who took a stab at documenting all the methodologies and all the different techniques like Kinefin and less and design thinking. And so look at this. So, uh, Hey, um, agile person, uh, I'd like to, uh, I'd like to make sure that we get a good product. Can you tell me where I am on the subway map? <laughs> no, no way. Um, oh, but that's not, that's not the end because once you figure out what certification you're going to buy and once you figure out what methodology you have to master, you got to install a couple of tools, don't you? Isn't that this is a fascinating graphic. This is the DevOps tool periodic table. So if you want to do some testing, uh, don't forget uh, JUnit, Sauce Labs, CompuWare's, Topaz, Appium, or Squash, or Cucumber. But we haven't even started talking about issue tracking in Jira or, or BMC's Helix or Trello or ServiceNow. I'm, I'm, I'm barely able to read all this. So um, if you're the CTO and you're being told to build a productized organization that exhibits business agility, take a look at your homework assignment, CTO or CIO, ops leader, good night. And so here's the irony. We value individuals and interactions over process and tools, but the only way we make money is on processes and tools. Uh, I don't want to say the word hypocrite, but I just said it. And this is the dark side. This is the thing that in order to see the light, we have to see the darkness. So how do we reconcile that? That we made some real progress, but there's this, ugh, this is thick. Well, Martin Fowler, co-creator of the Agile Manifesto, calls it the Agile Industrial Complex. And he coined this term in 2018 at, uh, at a conference. And it's a really good term to describe that, that we've industrialized enlightenment. The idea is that we're supposed to evolve and to become better ways of working, but we've got this industrialization of it. Well, how do we reconcile that? Well, uh, it's because by having that industrial complex, we've achieved agility at an industrial scale. That's how we did it. And now that we have a critical mass, now we can begin asking the question of how do we awaken to the next level of awareness and understanding so that the agile industrial complex doesn't play such a dominant role in transformation and evolution and improvement. So yeah, it, it was, it's a little bit embarrassing. It's a little bit troubling and it might have been the necessary step to take us where we're going to go. We're going to keep reconciling this dark side because now that we know that there's the industrial complex, one of the other challenges is that if anybody can do it, 
at industrial scale, well, then there are a ton of people going to do it wrong with fake agile. Uh, fake agile. Let's let's just take that ops team and rename them. You're now the DevOps team. Did we change anything? Nope. You're good. Rubber stamp. You're agile. Or how about our favorite water scrum fall or hybrid? Uh, now I got to be careful because I'm a big fan of hybrid as a stepping stone to true agility. Uh, you know, it might be all the agility that we can do right now is, is just sprinting on code. Never mind the innovation part, the requirements part, the funding part, never mind the deployment and the operations, but at least we're sprinting on code. That's a, that's a start. But a lot of people like, yeah, we're done. We're good. Rubber stamp. You're agile now. Oh, I know. If I use Jira, now I'm agile, right? Because then it's in the Jira agile. Is, isn't that what it's called? No, not anymore. But then there's this other concern that this fake agile actually starts getting toxic where now the manager just is now your product owner. It's still your boss, maybe your project manager, program manager, but now they're, they've got this enlightened title, like I'm a product owner. No, you're still just a jerk. And you're still just in love with your own ideas. And then you're gonna go into the, your daily scrum meeting where nobody's talking except the one dominant extrovert who's the tech lead. And we're all like, okay, I'm glad we're in planning poker. So ready, set, this is what I say it is, and this is what it is. Isn't it great we had this collaborative meeting? And then of course, doesn't agile mean you can do everything I want by the date I want? I thought that's what agile meant. Go faster, do everything. And uh, it got enough to where uh, this, uh, this phenomenon inspired Dave Thomas from the agile manifesto meeting to say agile is dead. This is not what we just signed up for. This is not uh, the agile industrial complex is, um, he mentioned the term in his, uh, in his presentation a year later as well. Ron Jeffrey calls it dark scrum, where the thing that was intended for light is turned into a tool for darkness where it becomes oppressive and toxic and dangerous. And so Alistair, what, Alistair Coburn, what he, he did is he, he, he sensed the same thing. And, and he just, he said, let's just reframe this whole agile thing um, and go back to the heart of agile. And so the heart of agile conferences started popping up and meetups started popping up and the agile uprising came around as a result of that. And it was like, it was billed as the second, the second birthing of the agile movement because we needed to get past the industrial complex, get past fake agile and go to the core essence, the core of principles. So this is tough. Fake agile is, is a real thing. How, how do we reconcile that? Well, the journey is available to anybody, including bureaucracies and toxic cultures and bad leaders and gray industries. And so as a result, we're gonna get some faux, faux agile, some oppressive agile because that tends to be the first step in the growth. I, I can tell you, I've met a lot of people who are today agile champions who were really toxic in, when they first started on their journey. And there are a lot of people I've met who didn't really understand what iterative learning and feedback cycles were about until after they screwed it up two, three times. I'm talking about somebody Jesse knows uh, looking in the mirror. So, so yeah, I, I, you mean growth requires struggle? Like in order to get to the good stuff, we have to get some bad stuff to come with it. That sounds, that sounds uh, cynical. Well, let me give you another one. How about agile sectarianism? Scrum is, scrum is evil. Scrum is oppressive. It's for micromanagers. That's why I only use Kanban. Well, you think scrum is bad? Don't do safe. Safe is, safe is bureaucracy and, 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 and agile clothing, agile in name only. Well, those Kanban people are so arrogant that they, they're, they're based, you know, like a, that they're not, they're not making us do burn down charts or any of that. They're so arrogant. They're just afraid to change. Obviously, they're just, they just want to document the current state and not do anything about it. If they really cared about change, they would have big room planning. Uh, and then 
Oh, how about this? I'm going to call BS on your fake corporate agile, your hybrid agile, which is the only possible first step that you're permitted to try. Or the or you might be renaming some of your waterfall methods into agile and name only methods, but you know what? That's the first step that we can do. And I'm going to call BS on your fake agile because you're not trying hard enough. Oh, and that agile vendor over there, let me just tell you what, they stole everything they have. They stole all of my intellectual property, even though this all started with an open sharing of ideas. It's my intellectual property. That cool slide that, that everybody copies into their pre PowerPoint. Oh, and then let's get the lawyers involved. Let's issue a cease and desist on your agile certification. Isn't it great that we've evolved to a higher level of consciousness as a community? Agile sectarianism, it's a thing. It's the belief that agile values and principles can only be possible when this methodology, this tool, or this certification, or this association, or vendor, or group is involved. And I'll tell you what, it's not possible at all if those people are involved. And again, this can be pretty toxic. If you've seen any of the discussion groups online, hmm, and then when things go viral, have you been in a LinkedIn conversation where somebody had something to say? And man, did they say it? And they're an agile coach? Woo! What do we, what, what does it mean? Well, it turns out it's not new. Greedy Booch said uh, in 2003, he had already seen three methodology wars in 2003. And, and he's, I expect I'll probably see a few more. And he was talking about the structured programming me methodology war where you had all these different uh, software th thinkers talking about this is how you do functional programming. And then he was part of the, the object wars. U UMT is better, man. Jim Rumble all the way. No, use cases are better. You need to learn your use cases and that's better than object oriented. And they, yeah, and now we're fighting over whose scaled model is better or less immoral and less corrupt than somebody else's scaled model. The truth is, it's a great quote, a gem cannot be polished without friction and this community cannot be perfected without its own conflict. That friction, that tension is what's going to reveal truth. So the way I reconcile that is that we do have a diversity approaches. That's, that's the, the exchange, the free exchange of ideas where open source started coming into play at the same uh, concurrent to all of this. But as a result, you get these divides, these factions, but it might be that that's the beginning of convergence and consolidation. The fact that now PMI and disciplined agile are the same roof the fact that uh, some of our favorite agile consulting companies have merged and come together where before they were competitors means that we're learning how to adapt. Some of it is market forces, but some of it is also maybe rethinking a little bit about, you know, maybe there's room for more than just my pet ideas. And maybe I'm letting my ego get a little bit too involved in my agility. So this is how I started. When I was doing the research for this, I, I, I had to come to grips with this dark side, with these externalities of agile, externalities of agility. And, 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 and when I started kind of thinking through this, it, it reminded me that um, this is what Hegel does um, in his dialectic, where you have a thesis, the antithesis, and then a synthesis of these ideas. So I think that the journey forward, if we've learned anything over the last 20 years, we're going to have to hold the contradiction. We're going to have to just embrace the reality, the, 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 the awkward truth that in order to get to the good stuff, we've had to carry with us some bad stuff and then start reconciling and synthesizing all those things together. So this is a challenge to all of us on the, on, in the session today is how can we start, how might we start synthesizing all of these these negativities into something that's a step forward. I know one way to get started on that. 
to check out what's awesome. Because here's what's awesome. It's working. 4X Mindshare, remember that? Well, that's just one trend. Here's another one. The people who got benefits from agility were statistically more likely to even want those benefits. <clears throat> this comes from the 14th Annual State of Agile Report. 14 years of surveys about how the agile community is going. And for each of these outcomes, going faster, changing priorities, productivity, quality, and predictability, on one hand, there's a percentage of the, of the market that wanted those outcomes from their agile transformation, their agile journey, their agile project. And if you take a look at whether or not they actually got it, it's looking pretty good. Like, it, did you want more quality? Well, you're 128, 128% likely to actually get that quality. The only one that's not a statistical slam dunk is going faster. And even then, you're, when you say you're 80% likely, according to the self-reported survey, so it's not observational data, it's, it's survey, it's self-reported, but self-reporting, 85% of the people say they got the speed that the improvement that they wanted to get. The, that's a pretty good day at the office if that's the worst case scenario. Yeah. Agile is a statistical, agile results are a statistical slam dunk. That's pretty inspiring. That's pretty encouraging. That's going to give me the, the, the juice to go into the office the next day and confront maybe the certification problem or confront maybe the tooling and vendor problem. Because I know if we can do a little bit of compromise and negotiating, we're going to get some goodness. Well, what about what's in the way? What about, what about barriers to agility? Uh, I did some research on this for my book and, uh, and we downloaded all 14 years of surveys and stuck them in a spreadsheet. And here's what came out. These are the barriers to agility and what we're, um, and there's a lot here to see. So I want to, I want to draw your attention to just a couple of things. And that is that legacy culture as a barrier is becoming uh, less of a problem for moving forward than it, than it used to be. So in 2017, you can see it really spiked to being a real problem. But now for the first time ever, culture is not the number one problem to achieving agility. Now the number one problem is good old fashioned change aversion. Also legacy processes used to be uh, a problem in 2016, really, pro and then over the last five years, we're starting to see that's less of a problem. The legacy process is holding back agility. Customer availability, however, instead has become more of a problem than it used to be. That now that we realize we need to be a productized organization, we need more product owners, we need to be more vertically oriented, it's hard to find decision makers. And so this circle here the, at the right-hand side shows me that we're converging on our barriers to where any particular problem is equally likely to hold back your agility. So and that's, that's to me is inspiring because it means that we're making progress on them. Remember, climbing the mountaintop, we, mean, we climb one part of the mountain, we reveal another part of the problem, but then some other problems are going away. Let me tell you what problems are going away. Here's another thing that came out. Some barriers are going away completely. So the blue line here, it used to be that one of the problems to getting anybody to go agile was the scaling issue. Now that's gone away and instead there's so much agile going on, we have a new consistency issue. Oh, and by the way, transformation used to be a concern, not anymore. Transformation's become an industry. So that's not, that's not, a, that's not a barrier anymore. And Gary Hamill has this really good quote. He's like, for the first time in the history of management, you can't create a competitive company anymore that's fit for the future without creating a company that's fit for humans. That's super inspiring. We're at a moment now where we can make a living for doing good. If you want to look for an agile job on Indeed, there are 98,000 agile jobs. Those agile jobs are also the most, the most uh, quickly growing jobs according to the World Economic Forum. So that makes me feel pretty excited about what's coming next, what we have in store for us. So those are the three things I wanted to share with you guys today. The rise of agility, it was actually the rise of multiple streams of agility, solving specific problems. And there was some dark side that we're gonna have to reconcile. And one way to start reconciling it is that we do have some inspiring trends to look forward to. And 
I have to do it. If you want to learn more, go to the book website, Untapped Agility, and download your free stuff. There's a free excerpt of the book. Chapter one talks about the same pattern of, of the rise of agility and the problems it faces. And there's also the report on those barriers. Totally free for you to download. Don't have to buy the book. Untappedagility.com is where you can get more of this stuff. Those are my thoughts, and I'm eager to hear what you guys have to say. It was an amazing presentation. We'll open the floor for Q&A. Uh, whoever has any questions, please uh, put it there in our chat, and we'll have Jesse answer those questions for you. We are happy to make you a panelist uh, temporarily if you want to speak. So while we're waiting for some questions from the viewers, um, I'm going to just, I'm just going to ask, what do my fellow panelists uh, see? What caught your attention? I can go first. I, I was amazed by how you aggregated the data for, for 14 years. I'm guilty of just seeing one year at a time. I never thought that there is a possibility of getting a bird's eye view of 14 years to see what has changed. So that was mind boggling. So I'll throw back a question at you, Jesse. Uh, how many hours of prep did it take for this wonderful prep, for this wonderful presentation? Yeah, that's embarrassing. I don't, want to, I don't want to let you people know how many hours <laughs> I spent on this. I'll tell you, it literally kept me up at night because I, I, there, was just, there was just so much and it was so yeah. exciting. And, and yet I needed to be truthful about some of the issues that we're facing. Uh, I mean, this is, this is what we do for a living, whether you're an engineer or a, a, pro, a product owner or a, a line manager. This, if you're here in this meetup, it's because you, you're passionate about agility. And so I was, I was passionate about this. Yeah, amazing. We're, we're, you know. I, I don't have words. It was just, even for a second, I couldn't think of multitasking. <laughs> yeah, great presentation. I have never seen anything put together in such a great way, which walks you through the entire journey of Agile. I think you have wonderfully put all the uh, all our experiences in, in in this presentation. So the dark side, how are we reconciling, then how how the truth of the, the Agile, you know, all all that. So well, well. Everything is put in. When I'm uh, when I'm hearing your presentation, I actually felt like you know I, this is me at some point. <laughs> so you got the point, <laughs> and I'm sure all the folks here can relate. So yeah. nicely excellent. done. Excellent, definitely excellent. Awesome, awesome. And that's what we are seeing from audience. Everyone is saying great presentation, and it was so well explained that they don't have any confusions or questions. Mm. Yeah. I do see one question for the largest government agile program, uh, about 60 scrum teams. How can you best standardize data and process if you aren't being prescriptive? Uh, that one comes from Sean. Thank you for the question, Sean. Uh, this is, this has been a fundamental question around scaling an agile way of working across a large program or across an entire company. And that is how do we balance these competing virtues? On the one hand, I have a competing, I have one virtue of autonomy, but the more autonomy people have, the more variation we have in the organization to, and the more complexity, which goes against the agile virtue of simplicity. And so a lot of leaders, they say, we want agile consistency because what they're saying is I want to simplify my organization to be understandable and manageable. It's a, it's a, it's a complex adaptive system, if you've heard of that term. And so would it be great if we could just standardize our data, standardize our process, so we would exhibit the agile virtue of simplicity? On the other hand, if I do that too much, I've negated the autonomy. And so in any conversation about uh, autonomy at scale, and this is the, the, I highly recommend you go take a look at what Zappos has done with Holacracy 
they tried a purist version of autonomy and it did not work. And, and they had to really wrestle with this question of where do we draw the line between common enterprise working agreements where every team agrees that they will comply or that they will co cohere um, and converge to some common expectations across the organization, but they also preserve some of their discretion autonomy. And it turns out it's just a series of hard conversations. And, and what too many people do in their rush to agility is they go too far in one extreme or another. So Tony Shea, the late Tony Shea, who was a genius, went too far in the autonomy side in the beginning, and he admitted it. And, and they, they have a very candid set of resources on their website about it. So Sean has a follow-up question that we currently measure over 325 metrics on the program. And without standardizing our approach for 60 teams, it would be impossible to be graded on our SLAs. Yeah. So uh, Sean, it sounds like your organization has found the sweet spot for uh, for their scaled approach to an aligned set of objectives. It sounds like we've, where there's some enterprise agreements about what our targets are and what our measures are. And now you're all empowered to self-organize. How are you going to achieve those targets? And, and so there's this, this yin and yang in play that we need to set some, um, some understandings across the board, but then leave some room for autonomy and self-organization. Gabriel has another question. What is your best recommendation to combat Fox Agile when a manager tries to use time as a story points instead of complexity? How do you explain the true value of what story points should actually be? So Gabrielle, uh, <clears throat> I want to offer a little bit of uh, sympathy here because the estimation, I totally love this question. Estimation, is ground zero for self-organization. I, I believe that it, it tends to be the topic that comes up most often because when we talk about how do we estimate and who does the estimation and what does it mean, we're getting to the fundamental question of whether or not I have a voice in my work, I have a voice in my commitments, or if I just have things thrust upon me. So this is, Gabrielle, you raise a really powerful question about how, how do we how do we raise this question? And I, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to speak some harsh truth. And I'm going to tell you story points do not matter. Story points are not the point. The point is not the technique. The point is, Mr. Manager, what's at risk? If we do estimation, you're, if we don't do estimation the way that you understand it and the, the way you want it to be done, what's at risk? And he'll say, I'll tell you what's at risk. I won't be able to tell a story about how much this team costs and whether or not we have a job. Ooh, now suddenly my story points are less compelling because it might mean I don't have a job. On the other hand, if I am give him the, his choice of using man days or person days as an estimate, Will you let me tell you how much it really is? Or are you just wanting to understand this so you can overrule my opinion? And now we're having a crucial conversation. We're having a crucial conversation about expectations, about what's appropriate and reasonable commitment. And I can make an appropriate and reasonable commitment if I do, if I assess and I size my work using cosmic function points. Remember those? Those came about before story points existed. Or if I wanted to use um, total slock count. I know that's a controversial metric. But if at the end of the day, the issue is about who has a voice, you might be, it might get a little bit far if you let go of the story points as the, 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 the battle to be won and instead focus on the battle of self-determination. And the reason we invented story points was um, to, uh, to help sidestep some of those conversations and get to a little bit more empowerment and self-determination. But uh, story points is not the battle I would fight. I would instead fight the bigger battle of whether or not we are trusted and believed in the work that we assess. Good question, Gabrielle. We still have uh, three more questions, but we are running short on time. 
Well, what we can do is uh, we can just keep the conversation going and those who um, are able can stick around for a little bit longer. I'm willing to hang out. So is it okay if I uh, do my word of thanks and I have a, a, a quick team activity for everybody and then anybody who wants to hang out, we can party afterwards. Is that okay? All right. So, well, thank you everyone for joining us for our first anniversary. We are super excited and Jesse, that was a fantastic presentation. So thank you so much for you coming and uh, commemorating our first anniversary and also kind of kicking off, uh, you know, a series of conversations we're gonna have throughout February. Uh, again, a reminder for those of you who joined later, our February event is gonna be on 18th. Uh, it is gonna be presented by Tricia Broderick and the topic is leadership when good intentions backfire. We are also part of the Agile 20 Reflect Festival, which is worldwide. Throughout the month of February, uh, there are tons of events and meetups happening across the globe celebrating 20 year anniversary of the Agile Manifesto. In addition to that, there is also an A20 conference which is happening. Um, it is being hosted from DC, but obviously it's a virtual global festival. And that is, um, that's gonna happen 11th to 13th of February, actually on the days when the Agile Manifesto was actually written. And we are happy to have uh, Alistair Coburn, uh, Lisa, uh, we also have Linda and Lizzie, amazing, four amazing keynote speakers. So that's gonna be happening 11th to 13th of February uh, by A20 conference, which LAN is a part of. Now, just for closing, if you would please take a couple of minutes to just put two or three words to say anything that you want about our first anniversary, Lance's first anniversary on the chat window. We would definitely want to hear from you. And um, Albert, yes, Alberto, yes, we will definitely add a link to those events so that uh, you can attend those. Once again, thank you everybody. Uh, so two or three words to talk about uh, LAN and our first anniversary and how you felt about Jesse's presentation today. Thank you. Now back to questions. <laughs> Rapid fire, Jesse. <laughs> All right, let's do it. Let's talk a little bit more. What's next? Yeah. So how can we balance all moving parts of agile transformation and DevSecOps implementation? Is it a culture thing or a technical implementation? <laughs> well, um, so you remember the big uh, subway map that was overwhelming? <clears throat> yeah, uh, don't do it all, <laughs> please. The best way to manage all of it is don't do it all. Uh, you pick out one area of consideration. My favorite way to start a conver agile conversation is what is the top two or three outcomes that we want to achieve with agility. Because agility is not the goal. Agility is a means to an end in order to achieve better managing changing priorities, better quality, better team morale, better retention of employees, um, faster delivery of value to marketplace, more alignment with our customers instead of always being yelled at our customers, those are, the, those are the outcomes, the problems that we're trying to solve by using agile methods and agile approaches and agile structures. So uh, don't do it all. Find a way to limit the scope of your transformation to achieve a certain set of outcomes and that will earn you the right to then begin working on the next round of improvements and changes. So uh, what I'm saying is, uh, Sasan, be agile with your agile. Prioritize the backlog, deliver value, and then earn the right to continue going. Thank you, Jesse. The next question is uh, curious. If you saw the new Scrum Guide address some of the dark areas mentioned today. So one thing that's interesting is indeed, uh, thank you, uh, Samir. The Scrum Guide was updated in 2020, and it was a Pretty inch, it was a pretty significant update relative to the last time, which merely changed a few, which added in the, the core values, which we had already known about. 
uh, I, I found the changes to be helpful, but not necessarily transformational. So for example, one of the key changes is that there's no longer a distinction between the scrum team and the development team inside the scrum team. We are now removing those silos because it was a bit of a silo. And now we're saying that the scrum team is the true unit of collaboration. And, and so that was helpful because there was a divide a lot of times between the product owner and the developers because you're not on the development team. You're not permitted to come to the daily standup. You're not permitted in the retrospective. You're a product owner, you're not on the development team. So I thought that, that that change was helpful, but it's not necessarily transformational in solving the deeper issue of a, an autocratic product owner uh, who, who wants to control everything on the team. So I think some of the changes were, were, were well done and, and, and move forward in a positive direction. Uh, uh, I also like the, the, the framing of three artifacts, each with its own commitment. I thought that was interesting, but not, not, not a transformational change. Uh, Samir, if you, if you were to ask me, it's a good question because it was, a, it was a raging debate inside a lot of experts who were, some were horrified, horrified that there would be a change. Um, I found it to be reasonable, appropriate, and helpful, but there's still a lot of work we need to do. Another question from Alberto, how do you manage senior leadership that have heard the beauty of agility and when they want to implement, they are still heavily process driven and not flexible for agility. And one is mindful of the power distance, especially in the part of the world. Yeah, especially in this town. Yeah. <laughs> because let's be honest, um, the color of your badge determines the amount of influence you have. Um, so uh, uh, this was uh, Alberto. Uh, thank you for the question. I, I love the question because this is a common struggle. All of us who believe in agility and know what it should look like, we have the unfortunate task of having to coach and mentor people who are just not good at it. And so uh, I think the key word here is empathy. The, the, so be grateful that your senior leadership is finally interested, but then have empathy that they're just starting your journey and you're 10 years in. You're literally 10 years more advanced than the leader that you serve on this agile topic and this agile journey and understanding. So have a little bit of empathy and patience for your leader, but then hold them accountable by telling them, so... Uh, Tell me, Ms. Vice President, if you're wanting all of us to, you're wanting all of us to go on this transformational journey. Yeah. Oh, I, good, good. I agree. Probably going to require people to change the way they do their jobs. Probably going to require some of new skills for them to learn. Yep. I totally agree. But you know, that means you have to go on the journey yourself as well. Because if you're not changing, you're probably the most important part of this organization. And if you're not changing, it's not gonna stick. Would you like help on understanding what this impact is, what the impact is gonna be on your, on your skill set, on your leadership competencies and capabilities and capacities? We can talk about that because I'm here to help you on that journey. I'm here to make that journey faster and, and less painful because you, we need you to be the role model for what that personal transformation looks like. Because if you don't show us how it's done, they're just not going to buy in. They're not going to do it. So have some empathy for the fact that they're early, way early in the journey and you're 10 times more advanced. It can be annoying and frustrating that they don't understand this technique and that they're not exhibiting the right behavior. Oh, sure. Oh. Have a little empathy, a little patience, but then hold them accountable that they have to be the role model for the personal transformation. Thank you, Jesse. This brings us to the end of all the questions being posted on the uh, chat window. Hey, Jesse, this is going to make your day. Somebody just texted me who's in the audience and said, this was like a TED talk. <laughs> well, I, that's what a, that's what an anniversary commemoration is supposed to be. It's supposed yeah. to be, <laughs> uh, it's supposed to be uh, like reconciling and and making sense of the bleh in order to like appreciate the yeah. 
You were just one year late, but you did us good, Jesse. Thank you so much. And <laughs> that was a joke. Yeah. And someone has posted best hour I have spent on Agile in 2021. So yes. great job. Let's, let's do that. Well, uh, looking forward to seeing the, the video link uh, and all the other opportunities. Looking forward to seeing everybody here in the next set of sessions and events. Thank you, everybody, and have a wonderful weekend coming up. And we'll see you at the uh, Agile 20 uh, Global Festival as well as at A20. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thanks, Ashu. We're all watching the attendee list go down and down and down. Yeah, I think that's it. Yeah, we're just going through with Toby, just pulling them off. Because some people yeah. like to hang around. Like, no, go home. Well, like the end of that Ferris Bueller movie. You still here? Yeah, I think, it, I think everyone's What happens gone. when it runs late? Like, they might be eating food in the microwave or whatever. And this yeah. <laughs> Well, thank you, guys. That was, that was a ton of fun. It was. It was awesome. Really wonderful session, and thank you so much. You are late, but it's really worth it. it was great. <laughs> Sorry, I was pulling your leg on that. No, no, I'm not late. I offered bonus content. Nice, nicely done. Very nice. So, but totally worth it. Thanks for coming, and this is a special uh, uh, session for us. It marks our one-year anniversary, and um, you coming us um, giving this uh, session is is even more helpful. And now folks will look forward more for land. <laughs> well, I'll tell you what, um, uh, Trisha is the bee's knees. So I have a deep respect for Trisha who um, is on the board for the Agile Alliance and is yeah. uh, an Agile leadership coach, uh, an executive coach. So she's amazing. Uh, you'll, you'll have a great session next month. Guaranteed. She was, and wasn't she direct? Wasn't she director of uh, Agile Alliance last year, or the year before? No, she was 2019 um, Agile Alliance. Uh, I think she was the chair. Conference chair. Yeah. Yeah, she was the conference chair. Yeah. It's amazing. Well, um, so please do send me a link to a download of the video because then I'll give it to my producer who will um, edit a little bit and then put it on. Um, I'll, have a link on my YouTube channel for it. And then you'll have a link on your YouTube channel for it. And I'll broadcast it out to the social media. Okay. So people know about the, the loud meetup. Okay. Um, so I typically have trouble uh, with editing. It's not that I don't know how to edit. It just doesn't make, I, it doesn't do it. to the top list. So if you are willing to edit, I'm happy to send it tonight to you. Um, so I know it'll get done faster. Uh, but if it's yeah. on my, uh, it's on my Kanban board, it'll take another week. No, I've actually, I have a part-time staff member who, who does that. Okay. Uh, uh, so I'm happy to send it to you. Cool. Cool. This was really, then, really good. I mean, honestly, Jesse, um, you, you blew it out of water. I mean, that's amazing. So much research. And I think, uh, your, your style is so, I mean, you say very assertive things. But you say it in such a such a nice manner that you don't you don't take it in a bad way. You're like, yeah, actually, I agree what he's saying. You know, uh, maybe, maybe so I should rethink story points. <laughs> <laughs> you know that question you did, you answered it very yeah, well. Really well. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's a uh, really common question. Yeah, G Gabby was my uh, intern at um, at Deloitte from college. So she this is her first year out of college. And okay. I'll tell you what, that, that question, it, it is, it's ground zero. It's where the fight yeah. begins and right. story points were absolutely invented to give teams more voice. 
Oops, um, let me stop recording one sec. Yeah. So uh, it's a legitimate, it's a legitimate point. I, I've just found that 